But without further ado, it's a great pleasure to to introduce our two guests today, Jack Shaheen and uh, Bernice Shaheen, his, his spouse. Um, they don't really need an introduction, I'm sure. That's why the crowd is so uh, large today. I hope you're all comfortable. I know this room doesn't actually fit all the time as many people as we would like to fit into it. But you're, you, you're here because of Jack Shaheen's uh, great uh, um, a reputation. Um, I, he's someone I would bracket with Edward Said and uh, James Sogby in, in what he does for the uh, Arab American community. Although, of course, Edward Said uh, studied the uh, Orientalism and therefore his historical remit went back a bit further than Jack Shaheen's. Nevertheless, Jack has done a lot. Uh, studying views um, and the reception of Arabs in, in, in America uh, in the 20th century. He was born in Clareton, Pennsylvania, to Lebanese immigrants and was the first from a small Arab American community to go to college. He would eventually become a professor of media studies at Southern Illinois University, uh, publishing works on the social significance of public broadcasting and on nuclear war films. Uh, he made it his life work, or he has made it his life, life's work, to expose and battle the perpetuation of negative stereotypes and imagery in television and film. And he has published a number of books, three of which I should mention, The TV Arab, uh, the most recent Guilty, which was written post 9-11, and Real Bad Arabs, How Hollywood Vilifies a People, which are very, they're, they're the variations on, on a theme. He's now traveling quite widely, uh, screening and discussing uh, the documentary film based on the book, Real Bad Arabs. In his research uh, for that book, he viewed about a thousand films from 1896 to the present that included Arab characters or references. And Shaheen found that around 12, only 12, gave positive depictions. 50, 52 were neutral and some 900 were entirely negative. And he's going to talk about that today. Uh, he is a recipient of two Fulbright teaching awards, holds degrees from the Carnegie Institute of Technology, Pennsylvania State University, and the University of Missouri. He is also now a distinguished visiting scholar at New York University's Hagop Kevorkian Center for Near Eastern St Studies. So he's a, a colleague of all us NYU folks in the room. And he is denoted most significantly, I should say, uh, his, a, a recent act both uh, of Bernice and, and Jack. They've both donated his work, their collection uh, of memorabilia, uh, um, uh, of images of the Arabs in, in, in 20th century American life, to the Jack Shaheen Archive at Tamiment Library and the Robert F. Wagner Labor Archives at NYU, which if, uh, if you want to know where that is, that's on the ninth floor of Bobst. Um, I, I hope very much that we'll be able to, to discuss that a bit today. I'm going to introduce now Bernice, uh, who will speak first for about 10 minutes on, on uh, her latest uh, uh, work, and then Jack will speak after Bernice, come up to the podium, and then we'll open it up for discussion. Uh, Bernice Shaheen also researches uh, Arab and Muslim stereotypes in popular uh, US culture. She has also dedicated her life to the study and fight against the vilification of Arabs and Muslims. Uh, in addition to being Jack uh, Shaheen's research partner, she has authored, quote, BC's Charmed Life, a compelling, which is a compelling autobiography about a young Palestinian American growing up in the United States of America. And that, as I say, is what she will say a few words about in a minute. Um, with contributions from her own family, this book provides a unique glimpse of the life of Palestinian Americans. She and her husband uh, launched a media scholarship program in 1997. And to date, this program has awarded more than, more than 50 uh, grants of, of, of up to $50,000 to Arab American undergraduates and graduate students um, to do work relating to their interests. In 2011, Jack and Bernice took their commitment to the next level by establishing the Jack G. and Bernice M. Shaheen Endowed Media Scholarship Fund at the Center for Arab American Philanthropy, the CAAP. We love uh, acronyms around here. In any case, it's a great pleasure, and please welcome Jack uh, and Bernice Shaheen. First, please. Uh, first of all, I want to thank everyone for inviting us. It's been great. Everyone's been wonderful and warm, and 
The biggest plus tonight I found out that two people here are relatives of people that are in my book. <laughs> so that shows you what a small world we, this is. Um, I'm not used to speaking in front of people, and this is the first time I've ever done it, so bear with me. Um, Jack worked on the uh, real bad Arabs, uh, how Hollywood vilifies the people for over 20 years, and I uh, helped him locate some of the movies. And after that was finished, I decided that I would write my memoirs. I really wanted to, it to be about my parents <clears throat> because um, my son-in-law and daughter-in-law and grandchildren to come were not able to meet them and they were wonderful people. So the book started out to be about them, but I didn't have enough information, so I carried it on to follow our, our lives. And, um, so <clears throat> this turned out to be my book. <laughs> and um, I came up with the title 10 years ago, and I never changed it. And my nickname is BC. And um, so I called it BC's Charmed Life. And <clears throat> in the book, in the front of the book, I have a CD. Our daughter's a jazz vocalist. Um, right now, she's a producer for the Jay Leno Show. But she put out this jazz <clears throat> CD uh, about 15 years ago. And in the back of the book, our son-in-law for Jack's 50, uh, 70th birthday did a passage of his life. And um, so this is a wonderful CD showing Jack's life. And also, I, I'll explain the book to you because it would be wonderful if you picked up on this idea and did this for your own families. And you younger people, if you can kind of have a little diary, of, you know, doesn't have to be daily, maybe weekly. And down the line, you yourselves can write a book. Um, this is a letter that my mother had written many years ago, and a letter that Jack's mother had written. So I think those are nice touches. Um, the bulk of the book, the beginning of the book, is uh, the history of my family and Jack's family. And then I have over 80 pictures of, um, of both our families, including sailing papers when they left Lebanon and Palestine. So it's, it's pretty well documented, and I think it's interesting for my family. Um, then I have also, I asked um, members, and I received all but two letters uh, of their memories. And so they're really interesting. Some are funny and some are tear-jerking. And after that, I have mem uh, letters from friends about how Jack has affected their lives. And finally, I have the family tree. And this took quite a bit of work because um, I had to do this all on my own. There wasn't anything in the computer on this. So um, I have Jack's family as far back as I can go to the current family members as well as mine. And then finally, I have recipes. And they're all <laughs> mine. <laughs> I mean, you know, they're, you know, Kibbe starts it off, but they're all recipes that my family grew up with. And so that's, uh, that's what I did. <laughs> <laughs> there is a, you have to excuse me, I, I can't sit. Uh, my, my nickname when I was a teacher was Dr. Pepper, and that was not meant as a compliment, uh, which meant I, you know, I always, there was pepper somewhere which made me get up and walk around. Uh, there's a wonderful uh, Arab proverb, I learned how to say it in Arabic today, but I'll mispronounce it now. But let me try. Yadun uh, Wahida Latusafik. One hand alone does not clap. 
Ah, yeah, you didn't understand the Arabic, but you understood the English. Uh, I'm very proud of my wife. This is the first time uh, she's ever really spoken publicly about her beautiful book. And what's important about the book is that I think uh, later you can meet and take a look at the book and speak with her. It's something, you know, especially in the Gulf, not only here in the Emirates, but in Qatar, in Bahrain, throughout the Gulf, you're moving so fast, everything is in motion, that you have a tendency to forget the traditions and what your parents and grandparents and grandmothers and grandfathers and great grand it's important to get them to tell their stories and to document that for, for, for the future, not only for your sake, but the sake of your children and grandchildren. So I, you know, I would encourage you to do that, you know. They probably don't want to do them. Give them some coffee and some batlawa, let them sit down, you know, and, and get them talking. And then they'll eventually move on. Bernice worked on that book for, I guess, at least 10 years. She couldn't wait, you know. After I did all of my work, it was sort of like, okay, you focused on all those horrific images. I'm going to write something very positive, something that young people can look to and they can use to help their families. And uh, I sincerely hope that you'll chat with her about BC's charmed life during, you know, after all of this is over. I want to express my heartfelt appreciation uh, to NYU uh, for allowing me and Bernice to be here uh, to share thoughts with you this evening. Uh, I was last in Abu Dhabi and Dubai in 2005. 2005, I came and I spoke at the Center for Strategic Studies along with 31 other scholars. And I met with uh, Abdul uh, Hamid Juma yesterday at the Dubai Film Festival. And I said, no more conferences for me. Too much talk, talk, talk. And he said, yes, Jack, but talk sometimes can be very good. I said, a panel, Abdul Jameed, a panel. Three people, intensive, coffee, you know, and then we can get some things done. We had a wonderful conversation, uh, he and I, about the Dubai Film Festival and other film festivals that are taking place in the Middle East. And it was wonderful to see him because I hadn't been with him since 2006 when I screened Real Bad Arabs at the Dubai Film Festival, and, uh, which was wonderful. You were the first to have Real Bad Arabs. I took Bernice to the mall yesterday, right? We went to the mall only because I wanted her to see the theater where we showed the film. And there's a great story. You know, tonight's very informal, right? I'm going to kind of go from here to there to here. We'll bounce around a little bit. First, I'll tell you about the story of the film. We get there, and I'm so excited, and we're in the projection booth, and the projectionist comes up and says, Professor Shaheen, Professor Shaheen. I said, yes, are we ready? He said, no, we can't find the film. <laughs> and all of a sudden, you know, you know, I had these, you know, is there a plot? Did someone destroy it? What's going on? And for about 15 minutes, no one said a word. And then finally, there it comes. The film arrived, and we showed the film, and we had a very, very warm reception uh, at the film festival. And so I have good feelings about Dubai and, and, and Abu Dhabi. Uh, I, I, I think what's, what's most important tonight, what I'd really like to, to share with you is, is the struggle. How did a young Arab American who knew nothing, literally nothing, about Arab culture or Arabs per se, until he became 39 years of age. I mean, I was totally ignorant. 100%, not 99%, 100%. I was more American than most Americans, you know? I grew up in a small steel town outside of Pittsburgh. I worked the steel mills. I dug ditches in order to go to college. I was your typical American kid, you know, reading comic books, playing games, doing things I shouldn't do that my mother never found out about, you know. <laughs> you know, all of those things. And thank God my mother had the vision to encourage me to go to college. She could never go because she had, we had a large family. We lived with my grandparents. 
and they took her out of school so that she could help my grandmother raise the family. So she scrubbed floors in school so that I could go to college. And it was really because of her influence that I went on, picked up all these degrees. And when I finally started teaching uh, uh, mass media studies in the late 1960s, I was really one of these hotshot professors, you know, for tenure, up for tenure. Now, the commercial break, you ready? Got to tell a joke. Two college professors, because this relates to the speech. Remind <laughs> me to go back to tenure, all right? <laughs> Two college professors, NYU, had just been granted tenure. So they were out having coffee, and they had too much coffee to drink. So Wen Chang looks at his friend Saul and says, there's been something I've been meaning to tell you, Saul. I hate you. No, Saul said it to Wen Chang. He said, I hate you, Wen Chang. And Wen Chang says, what are you talking about? And Saul said, you know what I'm talking about. December 7th, 1941, you people, you bombed Pearl Harbor. And Wen Chang looked at Saul, 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 you've got to be kidding. The Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. I am Chinese. <laughs> ah, Chinese, Japanese, Taiwanese, Vietnamese. You've seen one. You've seen them all. A couple of more lattes. When Chang looks at his friend Saul, he says, okay, here's something I mean to tell you. I hate you. I hate you Jews. You're terrible people. What are you talking about? You know what I'm talking about, Saul. Yeah. April 14th, 1912, you Jews, you sank the Titanic. Men, women, and children froze in the sea because of you Jews. Oh, Wen Chang, Wen Chang, an iceberg sank the Titanic. Yeah, iceberg, Rosenberg, Bloomberg, <laughs> Goldberg. You seen one, you seen them all. Now, on a serious note, seen one, seen them all, was responsible for the incarceration of Japanese Americans in 1942. We were, they were all perceived as the enemy, American citizens, over 100,000 incarcerated in camps. Seen one, seen them all, all Africans portrayed as buffoons, as lusting after white women. The result of that, the denial of human rights, lynchings in the South. Seen one, seen them all, all American Indians are savages. Reservations, deportations, seen one, seen them all. Goebbels' propaganda campaign in Nazi Germany, the Holocaust, six million Jews. This seen one, seen them all syndrome is alive and well today as it's ever been. You know, I grew up with the yellow peril. It was all those Asian, the Asian horde was going to take over the world. And then all of a sudden, it was the red menace. All the communists were coming. There was a communist behind every closet door. And now today, unfortunately, it is a green menace and Islam. And in order for the seen one, seen them all syndrome to work, hmm? in order for this to be effective, is it all right if I move around a little bit? Yeah, yeah, I, I'm sorry. In order for this to be really effective, what you do is you take a few select images. You portray Arab women as submissive, bundles in black who are mute, as terrorists, as sensuous belly dancers, okay? as beasts of burden, and you deny them, I'll tell you what you deny, remind me what, the, what we deny them. You take the men, you project them as obey sheikhs with too much money and too much oil, as terrorists, answer that, as boisterous bargainers in souks, right? And what do you leave out? What do we ignore? We ignore the fact that they are part of our common humanity. We exclude family. So we never show an Arab man and an Arab woman who have children and grandparents together. We deny that. It's what we call the sins of omission and commission. So what we leave out, what is excluded from all of this, is as important, if not more important, than the stereotype itself. Do you follow me? 
it is the exclusion, you know. We, we deny the fact that there are artists, that there are laborers, that there are people who want pretty much the same things that we want, you know. A good education, good health, place to party on Saturday night, you know, a place to worship in freedom. The same things, the commonalities that unite us. We deny the unification and we ignore the differences to celebrate the differences. And, that are, and, and we, we fear the differences instead of celebrating the differences, you know? Like I'm really envious that I'm not wearing a thobe right now. I would be much more comfortable in a thobe than wearing this suit and, you know, this suit and tie. It would be, you know, in a way. Okay, where was I before the venue? What was I talking about? Oh, the venue, tenure? What was that? Tenure? Oh, yes, yes, oh yeah, okay, tenure, all right. So I got this job at Southern Illinois, 1969. Sawa, hi. Well, yeah, the other thing I forgot to say when I started out, you know, there are friends here from Jordan. There's someone here that I befriended. He was a minister in Lebanon, a missionary in Lebanon during the Lebanese Civil War. He's the closest thing to an apostle that I've ever met in my life. We passed on recently, I, so I have friends from Lebanon, from Amman, from Illinois, and Abu Dhabi. My wife has just met people that re related to the book. So you see, we're not so far apart after all, right? We're in an auditorium in the Phoenician Hotel. No, not the Phoenician, that's Beirut. The Interco I'm sorry, uh, Intercontinental. The Intercontinental Hotel, and yet there are connections here. So I'm teaching at Southern Illinois. What am I teaching? I was trained to teach mass communications, journalism, broadcast journalism, criticism in the public arts, all the core courses that journalists learn. My courses had nothing to do with the Middle East. Nothing. And then I would say I had been teaching for only six years. And I received a Fulbright grant to go to the American University of Beirut. And that year in Lebanon pretty much changed our lives completely. I took the family to Lebanon, uh, traveled extensively uh, throughout the region. And I, I, at, at, at age 39, I met my first Muslim, if you can imagine. Went to my first mosque. I'd been in synagogues. I'd been in every kind of church you can possibly think of an Episcopal church, a Methodist church, a Maronite Catholic church, an Orthodox church, but I'd never, never been in a mosque where I had any interaction of, of anyone who was Muslim. And I came back home, and um, one, of the, one of the students today asked me, uh, what prompted you to do your research? And I said, my children, because when we came back from Lebanon, my children had discovered these cartoon images of Arabs. They could only watch television on Saturday morning. And they saw all of our favorite cartoon characters, you know, Popeye and Bugs Bunny, and these wonderful cartoon characters beating up on Arabs, even projecting Arabs as animals. And it was not funny. And they said, Daddy, Daddy, those words, right, honey? Daddy, Daddy, they've got bad Arabs on. So I asked them to please start documenting that. And so they had a work assignment every Saturday morning. <laughs> and now remember, this is before DVDs and, you know, and whenever they saw bad Arabs on television, Dad, Daddy, Daddy, I'd have to run downstairs with my notepad and start taking notes because it would be gone. I had to document it. So I started looking at Arab images in TV shows like documentaries, comedies, dramas. I'd get copies of TV Guide and I'd read all the descriptions each and every week. I'd look for shows that had Arab themes and Arab names. Then I would watch the shows and this is even before I could afford a video cassette recorder and start taking notes on the TV Arab. And I finished the article. 
1975, I wrote a great article called The TV Arab. And I couldn't wait to get it published. Now, you have to understand, prior to that, everything I wrote was published. They loved me at the university. Yeah, Professor Shaheen, you're from Pittsburgh. Yeah, I'm from Pittsburgh. You're a big football fan. Yeah, I'm a big football fan. Yeah, go get him. Go get him, Dr. Jack. Well, it took three years for the TV Arab to get published. Over 60 rejection letters. They're at the archive at NYU. One letter in particular I'll share with them. Shall I? It's from Harriet Van Horn, editor-in-chief of the Television Quarterly. Are you ready? I have it memorized. Dear Professor Shaheen, we have read your article and we find it to be extremely well written. Unfortunately, we cannot publish it. Shall I read it again? We find it to be extremely well written. Unfortunately, we cannot publish it. Why? She goes on to explain they cannot publish it because it was too well written and that there would be members of other groups that would write similar articles and they would be obliged to publish those articles. I sincerely hope you understand our dilemma. Thank you very much for sending it in. <laughs> then I wrote, and I forgot to tell uh, my friend uh, Abdul Jamid, I wrote to the American Film Institute when I did my first article on the Hollywood Arab and, oh, they wrote a really nasty reply to me, you know, about, you know, you're, this is not fair, et cetera, et cetera. And they refused to publish it. That's all changed now, but we'll get to that later. So what was I to do? Should I give up on it and stay writing about nuclear war films? Because that was my first book, really, How Hollywood Projected Images of Nuclear War. That was the height of the Cold War, the 60s in the 70s. As a young man, I was sort of an adventurer. I remember going to Russia in the early 60s when Americans didn't go to Russia, had no business being there. Going into East Berlin when Americans shouldn't go to East Berlin, no business being there. So I was very sensitive to what was taking place politically, and that's why I wrote nuclear war films. So I reached a turning point in my life, and I think it's important to understand, particularly for the young people, what do you do? Do you stop and say, this is damaging my career? Because I could have very easily stopped and gone on to do something else. But then something else happened. I was all of a sudden labeled the Arab professor. Arab, not in a very positive way. So my roots became an issue for the first time. I was no longer the Pittsburgh professor. I was the Arab professor. And I think that was a, the persons that did that did me a favor because I became more determined. Now, as I told the class this morning, it was not easy. I said I was alone. And then someone said, what about your wife? And I said, of course. My wife was there the whole time at my side, but she was the only one. So that began the journey to write the book, The TV Arab, Arab and Muslim Stereotyping in American Popular Culture, Real Bad Arabs, How Hollywood Vilifies Their People, Guilty Hollywood's Verdict on Arabs After 9-11, and the new book, which New York University just came out, A is for Arab, uh, which was released last year. Now the problem today, the problem persists that these images are still fixed. There is still a backlash. It's like I used to tell when I spoke to, uh, I don't know why, why did I bring all these notes? You know, I stayed upstairs for at least an hour and a half and I have all these notes. <laughs> I'm gonna use a couple of quotes. I will use a couple of quotes. Anyway, uh, where was I? Where was I? I'm sorry? Oh, A is for Arab, yeah. <laughs> the problem today is that it's a poisonous virus, this stereotype. It still permeates, it is still present. It's sort of like it's in the bloodstream, you know? It's there. And we know the cure. 
We know how to rid. We know how to get rid of this virus. It's just taking a long time. It's taking a long time for it to go away. The images remain fixed, although Hollywood itself, since 9-11, the cinema has changed pretty much. There are a few films like The Kingdom, which I th some people thought was a very balanced film, the one that was shot in Saudi Arabia, just because there was a Saudi working with these awful FBI agents who go over there and, I don't, don't see the kingdom, my God, it's awful. <laughs> and then the, what really upset me, the guy who did the film said he read real bad Arab so he could be objective. And I said, well, that, I won't use the word, I know some bad words in Arabic. If he really read real bad Arabs, why didn't he have me consult on the film so it would have been a lot better? But he was flaunting the fact, I read Shaheen's Real Bad Arabs, yeah. And look what he came up with, an Iron Man, you remember the first Iron Man? The horrible caricatures and the Taken movies. You know, you've seen these films, you know what they're like. But on the upscale, there's, oh no, not on the upscale yet. We're gonna conclude, we're gonna conclude like this, okay? We're gonna go like this. But what happened after 9-11, television. Hold on to that, that's a good quote. <laughs> television, all of a sudden, began projecting American Arabs and American Muslims as terrorists. And that started with the series 24 with Kiefer Sullivan. And the man who did 24, a man that I'd like to meet, a guy called Joel Gordon, who is the world's worst racist, but covers it up beautifully, currently has a series called Homeland, where the stereotypes, stereotypes are much more subtle. He's learned his lesson. But Joel Gordon, Joel Gordon, I, I'd love to get in a back alley with Joel Gordon, you know? <laughs> I'd sort of like to be a Pittsburgh boy again, you know? Say, okay, Joel, let's, none of this academic garbage or Hollywood, let's just you and me, let's go at it. Let's tell it the way it is and get to the truth. That's the problem today. Everybody kind of dances around the issue. Joel Gordon's works speak for themselves and he set a trend and as a result of that, there were a lot of harassment against Arab and Muslim Americans. People being detained. Recently, just a couple of weeks ago, there's a journalist. She went to a wedding in Toronto, Canada. She's coming across the border with her family. They handcuffed her husband. You know, they detained them for several hours at the border. At the border, American agents did the same with other people who were at the party for no other reason than the fact they were American Arabs and they happened to be Muslim. They didn't even tell them why, no answers. But see, that creates a fear. You know, that challenges your citizenship. That's as un-American as you can get. And somebody should take those border guards and take them over their knee and give them a good spanking. You know, with a real paddle. You know, let them have it. No, I mean it. There is no room for discrimination like that in any country to detain innocent people coming back from a wedding and making them feel less than human at the border. And that's minor, that's, these are minor things that are taking place. So the problem persists and the problem will continue to persist as long as we have these images of sameness. That's a good thing for you to remember, ready? I'll give you a quote, images of sameness. In order for a stereotype, a negative stereotype to be successful, you take the same images and you repeat them over and over and over again. Now, that's the bad news, right? Mm, 20 after. Can I speak for at least 10 more minutes? Yeah, okay, all right, all right. Good news. This is good news time, okay? Oh, good quote, good quote. I was at the University of Arkansas about 10 days ago, was it 10 days? I don't remember. I've been doing a lot of traveling lately, which makes my wife very happy because she doesn't have to cook. <laughs> she says she misses me, but I really wonder. <laughs> I really, I, would you have for dinner on leftovers? You know, doesn't, doesn't have to cook. Anyway, I'm at the University of Arkansas, and you know, because of Senator William Fulbright, who created the Fulbright Grants, it changed our lives, okay? And there's a statue of Senator Fulbright at the university. 
and a peace fountain, which I think is appropriate because Fulbright was a man of peace. And there is an inscription at the peace fountain, and it goes like this. Now, these are new. I had cataract operations, so I have to, I'm sorry, wear reading glasses, excuse me. The highest function of higher education is cultivating the free and inquiring mind and advancing the effort to bring reason, justice, and humanity into the relations of men and nations. Isn't it nice? Reason, justice, and humanity into the relations of men, and I'm sure he meant women, and women into nations. Senator Fulbright. Well, on the positive side, what has happened? What's changed for the, for the better? Uh, I'll talk personally, and then I'll talk more internationally. Ready? Remind me to switch internationally, okay? <laughs> uh, personally, uh, thanks to the vision of my wife, Bernice, we established, as you were told earlier on in the introduction, the Jack G. Shaheen Scholarship Fund. And we have awarded, in the past uh, 15 years, nearly 60 media scholarships to Arab American students majoring in media studies. And the beauty of that is, one of the, I mean, they've all done extremely well, these young men and women. One, Anne-Marie Jasser, has made two feature films. The other, Iyad Zahra, has made a feature film. Another one is the uh, National Public Broadcasting Radio Bureau Chief in Cairo, Egypt, Leila Fadl. She's wonderful, Leila. Leila's just terrific. She, I don't even think she's 30. And she's awesome. She's just a, I mean, she's just as good as they get, you know. One of the finest Arab American journalists on the air today. And she's the new Helen Thomas. God rest Helen's soul. That's one positive thing. Uh, a couple of years ago, Turner Classic Movies uh, asked me to select more than 30 films dealing with Arabs and Muslims. And they programmed those films uh, during the month of July 2011. And I commented on all the films with co-host Robert Osborne on Turner Classic Movies. That had never, been, never happened before. We address the Arab stereotype in over 30 films. And I even got them to show the cartoons, the Popeye cartoons and some of the other cartoons. And we nailed it. I mean, the host couldn't believe it. You know, because he was always challenging me, which is good. Well, what's wrong with this film with Abbott and Costello or Bing Crosby? And I would have to explain to him what was wrong with the film. And so that went on for a month. And of course, I was attacked by certain elements, okay? Certain people with a political agenda. You know, you can, if you're running for public office in the United States, if I wanted to get elected, all I have to do is say bad things about Muslims. You know? Vote for me, and I'll take care of those terrorists from over there, you know? Then there are these special interest groups that have a political agenda. Stereotypes do not exist in a vacuum. They impact opinion, and an opinion impacts policy. We talked about that in class today. We can do more about it later on, okay? So that's, oh, one more thing on a personal basis, the archive and NYU. Oh, it's a great story, the archive. I met this NYU professor, Professor Jack Chen. He's Chinese American. His nickname is Fu. I call him Fu, he calls me Jafar, you know, from Aladdin. <laughs> so if the FBI is monitoring our correspondence, you know, they're getting a kick out of it. Hello, Fu, it's Jafar reporting about what's taking. I mean, it's the only way. You've got to laugh it off a little bit, right? He says to me, we're interested in your collection. We understand you have a collection. And Bernice over here, who's quiet and yet does all the work, we've got over 4,000 artifacts in every room in the house, including the living room behind the sofa, in the bedroom behind the chairs. Please come, she said. Please come and look. So they came, I guess, about six, five, how many librarians? Five, four, five? Five people came. About five people came the first time. They invaded our house. I made them 
the Shaheen coffee, I make good coffee. Ahlan wa sahlan fiq. I make very good coffee. I think it was the coffee that induced them to take the collection. <laughs> and they said, you know, it looks, looks promising. They took the collection. It's now housed at NYU. What does that mean? That means scholars and students worldwide will have access to all this wealthy, this, this information which exposes the injustice that's been going on all these, all these many, many years. It's a treasure trove for scholars. They don't have to go any, I mean, it's all there waiting for them at NYU. And I'm deeply indebted to Professor Chen and others at the, at, at the university for, for accepting this, for accepting our collection. On an international basis, you have other good news. You have here in Dubai, the 10th anniversary of the film festival is coming up. Your festival in Abu Dhabi is coming up. In just a couple of weeks, you have over 100 films. There was a very good article on, in the paper today. I'm sorry I'm not here to see the films. You have a lot of young Arab filmmakers. I mean, who would have thought a Saudi woman would make a film about Sa a Saudi woman in Saudi Arabia? And there, here's, this film is having a terrific impact. Bravo, I say, onward, you know? And look at all of the young uh, Arab-American filmmakers that are taking all over. There are a couple of films called Just Like Us and The Muslims Are Coming by two comedians, Dean Obidallah and Ahmed Ahmed. There's a wonderful film called The Citizen, Detroit Unleaded, America. There's a wealth of talent out there now. Here in the Arab world, and the beauty of your film festivals, not only in Abu Dhabi and Dubai, but in Beirut, Tunisia, all over the region. Film is becoming part of the culture. It wasn't 15 years ago. And young men and young women are, are saying enough of this stereotype. We, we're mad as, and we're going to do something about it. We're mad as blickety blank, because this is a university. I had to, and we're going to do something. About it. We're going to create, and the change has to come from young people. You have to believe in young people. You have to be an optimist. And so I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled at the, the emergence of young Arab-American filmmakers and Arab filmmakers. But they need support. And when I was with uh, Abdul Jamid, I don't know how many of you know Abdul Jamid. He's a great guy. Very soft-spoken, very low-key, you know. When I left, he gave me the traditional Arab goodbye, you know. <laughs> Which I loved. You know, I miss that. You know. I really, it's kind of nice, isn't it? Yeah, it's kind of nice. Uh, one of these days, but not, oh, no, never mind. Anyway. Um, and so I'm optimistic about change. And is there anything you can do? The kids ask me today, the young people ask me, I speak out. You don't have to write a bunch of books. You don't have to give lots of lectures. But if you see or experience an injustice, do not remain silent. Why? Because to remain silent means what? Acceptance. Huh? If you know something is wrong and you don't say anything, it's acceptance. So do not allow that to happen. All right? All right. Now I'm going to conclude with a nice, oh, oh, okay, two things. Was, did I leave anything out? Yeah, thank you. Are you sure? Huh? I'm going to check with the boss. <laughs> huh. No? <laughs> it's nice being married a long time, you know. You get to know each other, you know, finally, you know. <laughs> Uh, see, I have to tell you, you see how warm, you've made me feel so welcome here. I'm usually very relaxed when I speak, but I don't, have you ever seen me this relaxed before? Relaxed. Very relaxed. Yeah, I'm very relaxed. <laughs> okay. During the Q&A, you can ask me about my experiences with Aladdin 
in the two films that I consulted on, Three Kings and Syriana. I'm not going to tell you now because it's almost 7, 7.30, right? Yeah. And I have a couple clips. Don't I have a couple clips I wanted to show? Well, let's show the clips and then I'll, uh, and then I will, uh, I'll close with a very nice quote. The clips are, I'll explain them first of all. The first two clips are of a Coke ad. The first Coke ad, Coca-Cola, was aired during the Super Bowl. And it was just awful. Notice the manner in which the Arab is portrayed. So I got on the phone, and this goes to the proverb, one hand alone does not clap. And I called the American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee in Washington, and I said, we're going to go after Coca-Cola. <laughs> and we did. And I, I was on the phone with Coke executives along with ADC people, but I was the tough one. They were, you know, kind of bureaucratic, very good, very supportive. And I kept, I was tough. You know, I was wearing my Pittsburgh hat, you know. <laughs> and, and bless their hearts, they were very receptive. And after our conversation, they did a make good ad, which was telecast on thousands of, 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 of TV stations across the country to make up for the ad that they did for the Super Bowl. So let's look at both those ads and notice the difference. Up on the music. Okay, hold it. I'm going to talk a little, then we'll go to the last one. You notice the Arab, right? He appears. His camel doesn't even move. He's inept. What's he doing there? Doesn't even belong in there, right? Why did they put him in? Why wasn't he part of the race? Why wasn't he in there as part of the cultural mix? They excluded him. We had a hard time convincing them that this was offensive. Finally, we did, and this is what they showed. Can we turn the sound up just a little bit? So I kept my word. I told the people at Coca-Cola that because they did this, every opportunity I had, I was going to give them credit. And I'll be seeing them in Atlanta when? Next November. month? November. November 2nd? No, November 1st. I see them in Atlanta. And I'm going to tell them. I saw it, screened it in Abu Dhabi, and everybody loved it. You know, as Coke sales went up at least 10% <laughs> in Abu Dhabi, you know? So I want my commission, you know? <laughs> Those are my Lebanese genes speaking now, you know? Okay. Now, this last uh, clip uh, is dated back uh, 1998, when it was not very popular to speak out against this stereotype. A wonderful young Jewish American by the name of Adam Yausch with the Beastie Boys came out with this statement at the MTV Music Awards. He may, he, this is what he had to say as he received the award for the Beastie Boys. And God rest your gentle soul, Adam Yausch. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, 
In addition to thanking everybody that's worked on all the videos and all the people that have worked with us over the years, uh, it's kind of a rare opportunity that one gets to speak to this many people at once. So uh, if you guys will forgive me, I just wanted to speak my mind on a couple things. And uh, I think it was a real mistake that the U.S. chose to fire missiles into the Middle East. I think that was a huge mistake. And I think that it's, it's very important that the United States start to look towards nonviolent means of resolving conflicts. Because if we, hold on, hold on, give me one second here. Because if we, the, those bombings that took place in the Middle East were thought of as a retaliation by the terrorists. And if we thought of what we did as retaliation, certainly we're going to find more retaliation from people in the Middle East, uh, from terrorists specifically, I should say, because most Middle Eastern people are not terrorists. And I think that's, that's another thing that America really needs to think about is our racism racism that comes from the United States towards Muslim people and towards Arabic people. And that's something that has to stop. And the United States has to start respecting people from the Middle East in order to find a solution to the problem that's been building up over many years. So I thank everyone for, uh, for your patience and letting me speak my mind on that. Okay. There's a lesson to be learned, and I show that clip usually at the end of most lectures, is that you should speak out against all stereotypes, not just against stereotypes of Arabs. One thing I learned in doing this research is that to be sensitive to how others are being vilified. My Asian, black, Jewish, Hispanic brothers and sisters, it's a good feeling. It's a good feeling if someone vilifies someone else and you say, that's not fair, don't do that. You may not like that individual, but don't bring in his color, his culture, or his creed. That's not right. Don't lump them together. Those people. Don't use that term. You people. Those people. Which is those that's used all the time. Okay. All right. My favorite quote of all time. I need the reading glasses. I'll share it with you. And I leave you with this. This is Robert Kennedy. He delivered this at Cape Town, South Africa over 20 years, almost 30 years ago. And it's something to remember. Each time a man or woman stands up for an ideal or acts to improve the lot of others or strikes out against injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope. Those ripples form a million different centers of energy and daring creating a current that can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression. A ripple of hope that can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression. So ladies and gentlemen, especially the youngsters in this group, make your voices heard, if not your voice, you know, Whose voice? Why don't we get together and form a global chorus, one which sings in harmony the blessings of humanizing all people? Thank you very much. Question. The question was how does he feel about uh, the Canadian sitcom Little Mosque on the Prairie? I don't know if anyone's seen it, but it's really it's rather it's rather silly, but it's very funny. And I was yeah. wondering if you thought it was a balanced I, production. I, I don't know it. I only know it by reputation. I do know a short lived series called Aliens in America, which was about a Muslim exchange student. It was a horrible title, but a very good TV series. It was short lived called Aliens in America. I highly recommend it. I used to watch it every week. Yes. <laughs> and I was just wondering, did you ever, as a family, be stereotyped as like a couple? Like, why are you traveling with your wife? Or like, you know, there's so many stereotypes with Americans as a portrayal of Arab families. I'm just wondering if you came across that as a problem. Well, we live on Hilton Head Island, you know, and it's an island populated by wealthy Republicans. <laughs> uh, no, no offense, you know, some of my best friends are Republicans. <laughs> I'm serious. 
Anyway, uh, there was a party. Uh, they had a party, and, 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 and the hostess said, we're really sorry you and Bernice uh, couldn't make it. You know, we had Christians and Jews, and had you been there, we'd have had Muslims too. <laughs> and, uh, and that's about as harmless. It, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. That on Hilton Head, when I really get, you know, I, I, I know the people that, we're pretty well known. It's a small island, 40,000 people. And I get together and I want to shake them up a little bit. I said, you know, the First Presbyterian Church, 1,000 parishioners now. It's great. It's growing. We've got St. Gregory the Great. We have more Catholics now and Hilton Head than we've ever had. And I said, wouldn't it be great if we had a mosque? <laughs> now, you see, when people can respond to that, in a positive way by saying, you know, Jack, it would be nice. They need a place to worship too. Then I think we will have come even further along the way. But I plant that seed, not, not saying we, we should have a mosque. I just sort of make them think a little bit, you know? So you, so you mentioned a bit about um, the Cold War politics and how it, at least in my interpretation, it sort of it, it follows it after the culture of fear in the Cold War towards Soviets. It's kind of changing now towards uh, Arabs in general. And I think in the U.S., the, the two main really prevalent stereotypes are, are, are towards uh, Latin Americans, specifically Mexicans, and towards, towards Arabs. And I was wondering if you thought that this culture of fear is going to change or whether, I mean, it seems to be so prevalent in American history, like, from when? Well, I, you know, I mean, every, everybody, the, the problem with this stereotype, it's been with us for more than a century, and it's time we relegated it to a video or a screen Valhalla. You know, it's done its uh, damage. Let's move on. Okay? Certainly there will be something to, to take its place, and politics will determine that. But this has been with us much too long. And let's take into consideration, too, I mean, we've never, the United States has never been formally at war with an Arab country. Those 1,200 films that I saw were pre-9-11. Why? Huh? They were pre-9-11. I mean, that's what people forget. So this somehow has to be addressed. And unfortunately, our le you know, we, we have to break the silence. And it's, it's a combined effort, you know? It takes more than one hand. Hi, uh, what are your thoughts about um, taking this thing out of stereotypes by uh, embracing them, you know, laughing at ourselves a little bit? Oh, I love it. I love the axis of evil and Ahmed Ahmed and Maz Jabrani and Dean. Humor's a great way. It's been done that way for, century, for, for years. Jewish comedians, African-American. Humor's a great way. I, I use humor a lot. Sometimes Bernice doesn't think it's a good idea, but I use humor a lot. <laughs> What is it in human nature that... Uh, ah. Is, ah. Yeah. I wish I knew. <laughs> you know, I don't need to feel superior by thinking I'm better than someone else, but evidently, man has always felt that way. I don't know. All I know is that his, history teaches us that when we vilify a people because of creed, because of culture or, or color, Innocent people die. They suffer and they die. And the sooner we recognize the vilification problem, the sooner we can do something to stop it. You know? And, and the worst thing we can do is nothing. And to let it go. I mean, the only reason that at my age, I told the class today, I. I told the truth about my age. I said, I just turned 78. The only reason I continue doing this is to motivate young people, primarily young people, and older people to motivate younger people, to take action and to move forward and become part of the process. Because most people, most people most of the time are good people. And it's simply a matter of effort. You have to make the effort. And believe me, I know it's not easy. Believe me, I have, I have visual scars all over my mind from watching all those movies. 
you know. But why not? Why not strike out? Why not illuminate, as Dr. King used to say, illuminate justice? Shoo, Yanni, can you think of a better? Hey, I illuminated justice today. Why not? Huh? You spoke of the century of stereotyping the Arab American. How would you say after 9-11 the stereotyping of Muslims has impacted Arab Americans or other communities? Uh, after 9-11, the focus has been really primarily on Muslims per se. All Muslims, whether they're Arabs, Pakistanis, even if you look Muslim, you know, five Sikhs or four Sikhs were killed after 9-11 because they wear turbans and they're perceived as Arabs. So it's been primarily a focus on Islam, more so than before. Before it was always Arab and the, the Islam was part of it. Now it's Islam and Arab Americans and Muslim Americans. So it's changed and that's a very, you're a very wise woman. <laughs> Who are you anyway? <laughs> oh, that's good. I haven't, nobody's ever asked me that before. Good. It's broadened. It's taken in Arab Americans, Muslim Americans, and Muslims per se. And there's the groups like the Clarion Fund. They, uh, you're making me tell bad news, but they, pre they presented a couple of documentaries called Obsession and the Third Jihad. If you look at those documentaries, they'll scare you. you, you, you you'll, you'll see a Muslim and run and hide. They're that bad. The problem with this is one of the documentaries made by this group, which was aired on Fox News, Fox News is not news. Fox News is Rupert's Murdoch, it's a, it's a culmination of the prejudices of Rupert Murdoch. So it should be called Rupert Murdoch Presents. <laughs> no, I mean really, and the man should have his tongue washed out in soap, you know. I'm in trouble. Uh, being German and being Muslim, I've been usually hit by double whammies when it comes to prejudice. Um, what do you say, is the, besides education, is the best way to counter a prejudice when it really faces you? Well, I'd have to have the example, not only education, I think exposure. You know, like I say to my friends, have you ever been to a mosque? Do you know the commonalities between the faiths? Do you know what Allah really means? Like if they went to the mosque here and they saw the 99 names of Allah, they would be very moved. You know, your mosque here in Abu Dhabi, what a tribute to, to God. I mean, it's so beautiful. I think it's beautiful. You know, I loved it, you know. I could worship there in a moment. I could bless myself and worship. You know, why not? No, exposure. And question. You question people. Why do you feel this way? You know? Hi, um, I'm a student at NYU Abu Dhabi, and I'm with um, Sohail. Uh, he's my professor, and he actually asked us to come here today because um, we actually took up a, a piece of yours, um, your essay on how the media created the Muslim monster myth from the nation. Oh, yeah, you read that in class today, so oh, it's, it's really my, relevant. Oh my, bravo! Yeah. So oh. I, my question would be, yes. uh, what do you think mm. would this conversation be 50 years from now? Do you think that there would be actually a natural end to the stereotyping, much as like other stereotyping has happened in the past? Or do you think that, you know, it has to be, we have to like do something about it? Come into my tent. <laughs> I have a crystal ball, I will tell you all. I have no idea. I think it's contingent upon the young people of today who need to be encouraged by their elders to make a difference, to make changes. I am, look, when I, when I began this endeavor in the mid-70s, there was no one. In the mid-80s, there was practically no one, even in the mid-90s. It's only been in the last 15 years. Now there are courses being taught at universities addressing the topic. Young scholars are writing books on the issue. There's so much that's taking place. It just needs to, it needs to be nourished and developed. And you make a difference. I can tell you one thing, if you sit on your T's, nothing's gonna happen. Is that the right word, T's? Or is it T-Z? 
What is it? I'm in trouble. What is it? If you sit on this, it's not going to happen. All you, you're going to expand. You're going to expand this. This is going to get bigger and this is going to get smaller. Good. Uh, sorry. I just had a question. Do you think that right now and in the long run, the way the, the media, especially the media in Europe and in the U.S., uh, the way the media is managing the issues or the events that have come after the Arab Spring, would that help to enhance or would that help to Depends dispel Depends on what direction the Arab Spring takes. It's contingent upon the direction of, of what happens. You know? I think the best way to help bring about a solution is presence. Presence propagates power. If you're present, you're not going to be vilified. You have to be present. When I was growing up, there were no black faces on television, no black faces in newsrooms, anywhere in the country, and very few women. You have to be present. And your presence will dictate, or at least bring some balance to the issue. Otherwise, you're letting someone else identify you. You're letting someone else tell the story. Your stories. As Plato, paraphrase Plato, those who tell the stories rule society. They are your stories, and you need to tell them. Hmm? Hmm? Or else. <laughs> Jack, a quick question. What do you say to those people who say that vilifying Muslims and Arabs is my right to freedom of speech? That's true. To some extent, yeah. It's my freedom of speech, but you know, you don't shout fire in a movie theater, crowded movie theater, do you? Words and images teach us whom we should love and whom we should hate. If someone wants to hate someone, they have a right. Do you agree with the Voltaire principle that you will defend, you'll disapprove of what you say? I disapprove of what you say, but I will fight to the death to protect your freedom of speech. So, for the most part, yes. Depends on what's being said and when and where. Okay. I'm not going to make a general statement. You know, when, when there's malicious intent involved, like there are people who are in positions of power, like Representative Peter King of New York. Do you know about Peter King who holds all these hearings on Muslims? He, he, Peter King is another bigot. Uh, for the record, I'd take him on, too. Uh, I mean, the man... Uh, we, we received, I was, I was blessed to receive an Ellis Island Medal of Honor Award in New York. When was that? Uh, May. May. And Peter King was also one of the recipients. They made a mistake. Uh, not with me, but with Peter King. <laughs> and I, I, I had to do something. So I, I went out of my way and said, Representative King, I want you to meet a fellow recipient, my friend Mohammed Abdulaziz. And, oh. Nice to meet you, Mohammed. <laughs> and blew him away because there was a Muslim getting a, you know, this Medal of Honor, you know? Just blew him away. But I had to, you know, I had to expose him to a Muslim American who was receiving this award. I didn't say anything, you know, it would have been impolite to challenge him then and there, just to make him aware of it. Okay? So that's how you who asked the question about change, fighting prejudice. You did, right? That's how you do it. My friend Mohammed, a fellow recipient. Well, he handled it very well, you know. <laughs> uh, before we call it an end, to an end to this, I want to once again express my appreciation to NYU for their support, for my collection, for the book. I would encourage those of you, I, I, I may, you know, to get copies of my books. I mean. Um, I really would. I mean, use Amazon.com. They're a lot cheaper there. <laughs> and uh, the documentary, www.realbadarabs.com. And I want to conclude by getting into trouble. Uh, my wife always tells me that I give her too much credit. And she really doesn't like that. But I must say to you, I could not have done this without her at my side. She was with me every step of the way until it reached a point where she could no longer look at the images. That she was become, 
she became emotionally impacted by the negative images. And she said to me one day, I can no longer do this. And without her constant support, just being there and encouraging me and helping me, uh, none of this would have been possible. And uh, so I'm deeply indebted to you. Thank <laughs> you.